for those of you who get frustrated and you break things, ask why. I, lots of people do it, more so men. And I could never understand why I damage my own stuff. Why, why am I, what is making me this angry? Now, two weeks ago, I had to drive over the other side of our country, which is a joke to anyone in the States, because it took me three or four hours <clears throat> from one end to the other. And I got to the London Orbital Motorway, the M25. Now, I used to live over there. And I'm driving in lane one, there's four lane motorways, and people are hogging the third lane. There's no other traffic. Now, that would have apps that would be my ultimate trigger and here i am in lane one and i start laughing and i'm like i'm aware of it but it no longer upsets me and i think that is the most beautiful thing for anyone with any form of anger or ocd of which there was plenty of that in my past you'll still be aware of all the ocd triggers but you now smile Hey, Martin, I want to welcome you. Hi, Jay. Thank you. Good. Thank you very much. Awesome. So I was checking out some things about you online just before you came on. And mm -hmm. what I'd like to have you do is just have you introduce yourself to us, and then right. we'll jump into, uh, jump into the topic at hand. Right. I'll try not to take up all the time with this. So I'm Martin Hewlett. I'm a 57-year-old guy that lives in rural Devon in the southwest of the UK. I've lived abroad. My father was army, so I grew up on army bases, Hong Kong and Germany mainly, and I am half German. My mum's German. Moved back to the UK at the age of 21 and was homeless, lived in multi-story car parks, got my life together. Currently, I've been a paramedic for 20 years with the National Health Service in the UK, but I've had to stop doing frontline work as I've been off ill for two years with chronic back pain. And next year I start work as a clinical supervisor for the ambulance service. And I currently run the Calming Anxiety podcast, which is all for mental health and mindfulness. Other than that, I've been blessed by having two families and getting a crack at the whip of fatherhood twice. Once as a newbie, I still remember because I was a house husband from day one. Okay. And my wife went back to her career two weeks after giving birth. Mm. And there, there am I, late 20s, with this small creature in my hand, thinking, ooh. <laughs> yeah, what, what happened? How did uh, we get up here? But it was by design. So that's me in a nutshell. And the rest will unfold and unravel as we chat. That is, that is fantastic. I, I really want to jump into your early, your first experience, mm -hmm. and then we'll contrast it against a second. So let's talk a little bit more. You had that story. You're holding your little one. It's two weeks in. You're at that time where you were a house, house husband. I, I conveniently lost my job three months before Jacob was born. I wasn't bothered at all. They're, young kids grow up knowing that they want to be pilots or doctors or astronauts. I wanted to be a dad. And that yeah. become evident from my childhood, which was very problematic. And here I was. I, we had the conversation, me and my wife, and I just said, I'll stay at home. And she was like, yeah, good, because she loved her career. And I just remember standing at the front door, waving her off to work and holding Jake and going, yes, this is it. And it wasn't all roses. I, I, I was still a very tricky individual with what I'd been through in my past, but I wanted to make this huge effort in breaking that cycle. I can speak openly that my brother didn't do that. He was older but he's no longer with us. And he let his past dictate his life. But 
I absolutely threw myself into it. And Jake, I know all parents, especially new parents, go, my kid's lovely. But Jake was. I would do all the shopping with him in one of those carry thing, slings on my front. And so many people would stop me and go, he's, he's gorgeous. And sadly, he's grown up and he's got an attitude now. He was my idea of a perfect child. And then you caveat that 18 months later when Tom, my second son, came along, that I just could not bond with for about six months. I, and I'm really self-aware and critical about what, why I was thinking this. And Tom was born with bandy legs and a big fat head. You know? <laughs> I was just okay. like, you're not, you're not Jake. But mm. then he came into his own. And by anyone's accounts, Tom is a very handsome. I don't know how I managed to help produce that child because he, he is so enigmatic, handsome, empathic. Everything I wasn't. And he's in his six foot something and I'm five, seven. Uh, and my other son's six. And they always look down and pat my head. But we still have a really great relationship. It was fantastic. You said something earlier, I thought that was really striking. You mentioned that you, number one, that you knew you wanted to be a father, but that number two, that there was a generational pattern that you yeah. wanted to break. And I'm curious yeah. if you could take a couple minutes and, and describe to us what that was about. My dad was a very difficult, very abusive man, mm -hmm. uh, physically and emotionally. I hold no grudges about that because after he passed away, I found out more about his life. So he was very high up in bomb disposal. Okay. He had us as a family very late on in life. So he was actually in the eighth army in the desert rats and fought in North Africa and then okay. up through Italy. Okay. Uh, so I now know he, he had the worst form of PTSD possible. And he just wasn't pleasant, you know, and, but I then ended up in psychiatric care at 14 and a half. And one thing they instilled in me is just don't let your past dictate your future. You can have all this bad in your world, but it, yes, it is going to affect you. And, and it still did up until seven years ago when I had some incredible help. And if I was a religious person, I'd say I've been born again. But I am now the person I've always wanted to be, which is fantastic for this second part of my parented life. So, yeah, my father didn't teach me anything of any benefit. Okay. But that was his background. This is a guy who went into military school at the age of seven. And his whole life was army. And we had to call everyone sir. It's a very regimented upbringing. Mm. And I didn't want that. I didn't want that for my kids. And from the day they were born, I just played. I think I, I was very lucky. I then got to live my childhood through my kids, but not in a pushy parent way. Sure. So it was playtime all the time. With yeah, very, I can. Yeah. I, I'd like to, 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 to pick on that one a little bit because definitely the roughhousing, the play of the father is something that isn't always so welcome, but rather than to hit that piece, what I'd like to see is how has that impacted both Jake and Tom? And let's frame that a little bit more. You knew you didn't want to be your father. Yeah. So you made some choices for yourself and you didn't want that strictness, that regimented lifestyle, right? Yeah. It has its benefits and pros and cons. No, you didn't want that. And as you made a completely new, you, you were really on the frontier for yourself, you made a completely new decision. You had these, these two children, lovely boys, and a completely different relationship with them. But I'd really like to understand from your perspective what you've seen based on that choices of that playfulness, of that care, that attention that I'm going to be assuming, how that's manifested in, in your children. They're very caring and very aware of other people's needs and feelings. And they're both, Jake's engaged, he's now 29. He's been with his fiance since school. It's just like, oh my God, they don't want kids. 
Okay. It's like, it's a bit annoying. Tom is with his wonderful partner. They've just bought their own place. They don't want kids. Mm. And I'm like, okay. I wonder if that gene will kick in for either one of the four. But I wonder now if my nurturing has had a direct impact on their desire to have a family at all. It's, I do find it, it will perplex me up until the point that maybe they do. I hope you, I hope the perplexion is okay, but um, just, I would just say from an outside looking in, I'm sure that has nothing to do with you. There's a tremendous amount of societal pressure to, to not. Yeah. There's a, a lot of folks, in, and I think this is really great because it's going to lead into the next piece. A lot of folks think that becoming a father is the full stop end, full stop end of, of certain thing. And so given that thought, what, how about we discuss, you know, you knew you always wanted this. You knew you always wanted to be a father. How would we speak to folks? How would we speak to folks that were on the fence? Maybe they didn't want to, or it just wasn't in them. What's something that we could say to them or something from your experience that might let them know that it's going to be okay? Because if people turn around and say, I can't afford it, mm -hmm. everyone affords it. Everyone affords children. If we couldn't afford children, the human race would just die out. Because in black and white, no, you can't afford kids. But everyone does. Yeah. And sometimes the lower the social income and equality, the more kids. And not because they're going to get on handouts. I'm talking globally. You make that fundamental change when that little thing is presented to you and you just change. What well, most of us change. And the... <laughs> It's hard to quantify the amount of joy you get in the simple things. Mm. That this little human is so devoted to you and needs you, and you give back. And then you see this small human starting to grow. And I, I just think ten, two to ten, when they start to become inquisitive, some of the questions they ask you, you do sit back and go wow yeah we don't give our small children credit for how bright and how much they need nurturing and luckily for my boys just like my brains over there i soak up information i don't retain it that well at times but i'm always willing to learn with them and, and i'm getting to do that with young henry now who's nine and it's, his brain is so keen. And I, I think if you can take your own needs out of parenting and just look at this other little human that you've created and think, how can I best serve this little one today? And you don't have to be perfect. And you are allowed to have those days where you get frustrated and you just want to, I don't know, not be there. But that's when that, paternal nurturing does kick in you think actually he's quite dependent on me so you don't have to you don't have to be the best dad you don't have to be the best person in the world you just got to put your child's needs a little bit above your own yeah right? because 100%. you created them yeah and yeah. i didn't always get it right but one thing i do is apologize when i'm wrong okay uh, and I think that's a very big quality in being a good father because we are still human. We still react. We're a product of everything that's ever influenced us. And I'm more aware of it now with Henry, especially after I became a lot calmer as an individual. And I will turn around and say, look, Henry, I'm sorry. I got that wrong. You were right. And that builds his self-confidence. 100% makes him realize oh actually i'm allowed an opinion of course you are everyone's allowed an opinion but i do turn around and like when the kids argue say right one of you has to be quiet and you're not allowed to come back with a but ever right. 
you listen to them. You want you make them appreciate that you've listened to them rather than you're just waiting your turn. And it's really interesting to see them, especially the two new ones in my life, because I took them on when they were three and five, their stepkids. That is a very powerful, I think, mechanic, a very powerful tactic. Let's take a minute and just break that down into a, a sequence of, of events and how a father could initiate that with their children. So they'll be arguing, which is quite regular with these two. And I'll just walk in, I go, time out, stop. Uh, and they hate it. I go, no, stop. They know what's coming, right? <laughs> <laughs> coming. And it's just, you can see that frustration. And I'll just do it randomly again. Emily, tell me your part. And they know that Henry now has to be quiet. Even if he vehemently disagrees with what Emily's saying, he has to be quiet. She needs to tell me. And then she has to be quiet. Okay, Henry, tell me your part. And then I get them to discuss their reactions mm -hmm. and why they do that. And then I'll arbitrate, or if I just think they're being absolute loons again, and they're arguing over the most inconsequential rubbish, I just go, telly's off, tablet's off, no more. You were shouting. You can't be brotherly and sisterly about it. So that's the punishment. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and they just... <laughs> I think that's fantastic because it's it's very empowering to one of the one of the phenomena that we're dealing with today is that is this idea of ghosting the idea that you're unsubscribing from something you can just leave without giving any feedback and I think that this idea of sitting down listening to each other perspective taking on the perspective of the other person and then yeah. working out what's going on with an actual consequence, I think that's a very powerful tool. And I think that's going to serve any child and probably any father moving forward. So I think that tactic is really awesome for your kids. What about, how, has that ever shown up for you as the husband? So the, as a similar role, do you do something similar with, with your wife or your spouse? I'm getting better, right? So <laughs> right. in my first marriage no we set each other off and and it i my ptsd from my childhood manifested it so i used to react i had a dissociative identity disorder so i failed and i know people don't you didn't fail but i did i failed my marriage by not being able to understand but i did have that problem and then I had it cured, which was just the most amazing day of my life. Just right. having all of that hatred and self-loathing go be switched off. I still get it wrong and I still have dips. And my partner, Stella, is so good at and that she knows what I've been through and she knows I am trying so hard, but I do get it wrong. And then she'll turn around and she'll go, you were really rude then or you were out of order in what you said. And as hard as it is, I have to stop and I have to go, okay. And I'm, that old frustration is boiling those triggers, that four-year-old emotional response is wanting to tear out and burst mm -hmm. at the seams. And I go, I just need an hour just to really push this down because it is people with these PTSD triggers other people just think, well, you're mad. What? That might be not the right word to use, but seeing as I'm one of them, I can use it. <laughs> She's really good. And I, I then analyze why I've reacted. And it is hard. And for dads who do react angrily, you can control it. You, mm -hmm. No one else is going to save you from not controlling it. And if you really care, which you do, because they're your children, or even stepchildren, and that's a little issue we need to talk about, taking on stepkids. I do get better at turning around and going, yeah, I'm wrong, just give me a minute. But you need a spouse that understands you are struggling with your male, your masculine, because there is that still base brain stem level mammalian response to things, which really fires blokes off makes us angry and yeah. control is problematic for a lot of us 
and I don't wish to upset or offend anyone with that. Stay I, I always, I, I always think of that as, as calming the bear. Just like, yeah. hey, the the bear's in there. Just give him a little stroke and see yeah, what absolutely. he needs. You do. You, yeah. We are still. We've evolved over the last two thousand years into this big society, but basically, we are still a three hundred thousand year old species with these base instincts and i saw that i saw the darker side of being a male when i split up and then i was very aware of it when i started dating my other half and her ex-husband then had to put up with another male with his kids yeah and that is something that i think every man that wants to be a parent to stepchildren really has to take on board and be aware of you are going to get a lot of anger from the ex and i was really aware of it he would he would phone up and he was awful back then all right and i just understood it's not my place to make things worse this guy is going through my worst nightmare yeah if my wife had left me when the kids were young i would have been that kind of pain in the ass to her and i was really annoyed with that i was really upset that i had this strong base instinct they're my offspring and no other males allowed in there so for right. stepdads very tricky and you've got to tread really carefully yes you love this woman but you then have to also go from I like this girl. I want to date her to actually these kids are now a responsibility of mine. And that's a very difficult barrier as well. Becoming a stepdad and mm -hmm. actually taking on that role and putting your view on upbringing slightly to the side for a while, letting mum do it. Who's generally been a single mum for a while. And that doesn't sit well with a lot of guys because we are stricter. And I think a perfect family, they need this. They need that softness and deep maternal love that us guys will never have. We're all mm -hmm. jealous. We never gave birth. But then they need that male dominance to mm -hmm. survive, to understand it's still there from all of those years of evolution but that that's my that's just my emotional feeling and i think it works really well and this evening i picked the kids up they'd been at their dad's for the weekend and it was so nice me and their dad get on we call each other mate all right and our joint goal is these kids let's go there a little bit more there's a difference when you have a collective of other fathers, each with their own children, and you're trading, talking, discussing, hanging out, sharing the stories about what you're doing with your kids, what you're doing in your family. Yeah. Completely different relationship. Right. So let's talk about let's talk a little bit about that evolution, right? Because that, that would have taken work, effort. And we know I I know and I can feel it, right? That came from your desire to serve your children. I get that. Let's talk about how that relationship evolved. I don't, I, it's just organic. It's just a, dis, for me, as I became more aware throughout my life of the impact and trauma of my childhood, and then the mistakes I'd made through my marriage and the times I lost my temper with my kids, which then upset me even more. Yeah. And it was, it really was a journey of other people don't react the way I do. And then the shocking part was the amnesia of some of the things I'd done, not to the children, but in relation to my wife at the time. For whatever reasons, if I was triggered, and she always told me after we separated, I said, how bad was I? I'm trying to improve as a human being. And she said, do you remember when we went on holiday and you poured orange juice on my side of the bed? I have no recollection. None. Zero. Zilch. Not trying to hide it. I'm just saying, 
did I really do this? Please be honest. Did I do that? She goes, oh yeah. We had an argument. I threw something at me and you just upended this glass of orange juice all over. And then the next morning you woke up as if nothing had happened. And to me, nothing had happened. And so I was then aware that I had upset my two boys at times with my reactions. And I was so focused on trying to improve. Yeah. And when they became adults and I'd moved out, we, me and my two boys had always gone on holiday on our own since they were like eight and 10, just boys holidays. And we did that up until two years ago when we all went off in our Japanese drift cars together. All right. But yeah, that was a top gear moment. It was brilliant. I'm really open and candid with them for any of the bad that I've ever put you through when you were younger. I apologize. I have struggled. They know the massive change I've made. And, and I say a few years ago, I went through lots of like my black day when three bad things happened at once. And my sons always look at that and go, how you turned that bad day into a positive. And my youngest once had an interview and they said, who's your role model in life? And I said, oh, who did you choose? He went, you. And I was like, yeah, whatever. He doesn't know. He said, that day that you came home when you'd snapped your bicep ligament, you got a diagnosis that your uh, skin cancer now was more aggressive and you got to have your nose cut out. And then you'd walked home with your arm in a sling to see mum had driven off and packed and left. That would have broken most people. And Tom just went, and you were in the gym the day after surgery with your arm in a sling. You'd got stitches in your nose and you were training and telling people not to feel sorry for themselves. It goes, that's a role model. And I was just like, wow. That was the most touching moment ever. I thought, oh, wow. I brought them up. I was really happy. I'm getting a little bit choked up there. Oh man, I would love that if my daughter said that to me. I think that this is something that every man contends with. Let's get into managing anger a little bit, if we could. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So I've had two lives all my life up until seven years ago when I had this rewind therapy. I was an angry person. Everyone knew me as angry, amusingly angry right I, so we're driving down the road in the ambulance and i'd go look at those blooming lampposts all so vertical and perfect oh, i hate lampposts and i'll just go off on one on lampposts and my crewmates like okay and i wasn't a violent person but i had a violent te temper yeah and i we for those of you who've get frustrated and you break things ask why I, lots of people do it more so men and i could never understand why i damage my own stuff why, why am i what is making me this angry now two weeks ago i had to drive over the other side of our country which is a joke to anyone in the states because it took me three or four hours <clears throat> from one end to the other and i got to the london orbital motorway the m25 now i used to live over there and i'm driving in lane one there's four lane motorways and people are hogging the third lane there's no other traffic now that would have apps that would be my ultimate trigger mm. and here i am in lane one and I start laughing and I'm like, I'm aware of it, but it no longer upsets me. And I think that is the most beautiful thing for anyone with any form of anger or OCD, of which there was plenty of that in my past. You'll still be aware of all the OCD triggers, but you now smile. And that's why I set my Calming Anxiety podcast up. The main demographic was people like me. And you, you you're a bit younger but <clears throat> i did it for guys generally 40 and above that's what i thought but actually the largest audience that i get are women aged 20 to 34 
I'm like, all right. Um, That's interesting. Still, yeah, it is. Not complaining. So I, I produce shows now with guys like us in mind and a younger female audience. So there's quite a lot of work there involving the word love and affection, mm-hmm. which I would always think that guys like me wouldn't use, but actually there's still quite a high percentage that listen to that. I think we're getting better at being more open about being affectionate and caring. I think when I look back at history and I look at the older societies, when danger was around the corner, Mm. right? And you had to be a warrior, right? Defend against the, the saber tooth that was coming in or the bear that was, that might come into camp or the wolves or something like that. I can imagine that there's a, there was a certain level of, I would say consistent activity by the men, by the fathers in those societies where they're always going out, always hunting, always preparing, always protecting, always defending. And it's interesting because I think as men, we tend to more show affection. We tend to more, it's more of a, it's a state of being. It's less the verbal element and it's less speaking it into existence, but it, it seems to be more like, oh, I'm doing this thing because I love you. I'm doing, I'm protecting the tribe because I love you. I'm, I've got this job. I'm bringing home the income because I love you. We have this house because I love you. And so I, it's really interesting now that as the, as the roles are becoming more equal, right? That the burdens of both are being equal, equally shared across. And I think it's a really interesting thing to watch that as men are taking on more of the expression of their affection, because I would make no mistake. We're all, we all want that affection. We all want to receive it and we all want to give it. Right? That's just built into us. As those roles are, are shared, that, that dynamic is like what you're describing, that the young women are coming in. They want to have more of that anxiety, that help with it, more calm, but also that men are getting used to the words, right? The words. And I think that probably the one thing I would say that needs to be stated is that expressing your affection doesn't make you less a man. No, not at all. And I've seen a a massive shift, certainly within the workplace and the ambulance service. Mm. Guys my age group are being more open about what they're going through. The pressures of life, not the job, because most of us have a very dark, twisted sense of humor mm-hmm. and we're ideally placed to do the job. We are struggling with the dynamics between, say, guys' 40s into their 60s doing the job and now very gifted, capable 21-year-old females coming in. I prefer that dynamic because when we go to a patient, if I'm going to a female, it's so much nicer to let <clears throat> Amelia or Macy do it because well, it's just common decency. Yep. But we do we struggle within the crew room of what can and cannot be said. That's interesting. But the guys, I've seen a few over the last few months have out of the blue had massive breakdowns. But this time they're able to be very open and say, I'm struggling, I need help. And that would never have happened five or 10 years ago. Yeah. Yeah. As I've got to go ahead. But I think that's a benefit of people like yourself having this podcast so more men are starting to listen casually and go oh it is okay to talk it is all right to not be all right i can go and if i'm struggling and i'm a private person i can listen to someone Mm -hmm. who's been and that's why shows like yours and mine we develop that deep trust and intimate bond with the people we serve 100%. 100%. 100%. 100%. And that's why we're all here. Absolutely love it. I've got some, I got some questions for you. I'd like to run them by you. So the first would be in your experience, what was something that you learned about fatherhood that really surprised and delighted you? 
that the absolute inquisitiveness, I th and because of my analytical brain, I just think that's hardwired into humanity, full stop. But right. I wasn't prepared for it. Those times when our children are sponges, they pick up on everything we say. And I mean everything. Uh, <laughs> if I may do a really cool anecdote, which you may need, I'll try and do the bleep myself. So family driving into Brighton one day mm -hmm. and because of the child seat arrangements we had then there's me driving Jake's aged about two two and a half he's in the front left because we didn't have airbags in the front of those cars there. okay wife and very young Tom's in the back we're at these traffic lights they're red and then they turn amber for about a millionth of a second to which Jake says get an effing move on <laughs> but didn't see effing to which i could feel my wife's eyes burning into the back of me i look back on it now with humor but i had let myself mm. i realized no child a should say that but b should be aware of it which shows how angry i was at every single traffic light yeah i think that was an eye opener but anyway they were inquisitive and so we would read and also so my wife had a career so the kids got played with all day long by me out right. in the woods making fires building dens and then mum came home homework mode reading and writing because that's how she nurtured she was brilliant i could not have picked a better mate for my children and she did likewise for me we may not have been ideally suited as a couple but we're still really good friends we meet up whenever we're in the same area but we were ideal to create two wonderful young men oh that's so good to hear yeah it was, hear. it was just brilliant but yeah inquisitiveness you are going to be amazed at what they listen to and how they retain because their brains are making all of these neuron connections every moment of the day yeah so you never waste an opportunity to teach. Perfect. What's a piece of advice that you were offered on fatherhood that's been meaningful and impactful? Zilch, none. I can't remember. But then I, I have amnesia from before 14. I don't, I didn't have a guide. The fatherhood figure for me was my father-in-law, mm. possibly one of the most liked high achieving humans i'll ever have the honor to know when we got married he did his speech and said i not so much gained a son-in-law as another son and he, he nurtured me he was brilliant and my mother-in-law was fantastic as well <laughs> i everyone goes on about their in-laws but mine they were perfect they were brilliant it just, oh. i was so lucky <laughs> really oh. Um, yeah. Okay. And what would you tell new and potential fathers about the journey? As hard as it is, enjoy every moment. Now, you'll have those bad moments. So I bath the kids. I'm feeding Tom with a bottle. Jake walks into my bedroom with freshly done bed sheets. Yeah, I used to do all that at times. And Tom then projectile vomited all over Jake, all over the new bed. Jake just went, Tommy's been sick. I know. Walks back, gets in the bath and cleans it. And as bad as that moment is, I just like, that is hilarious. Yeah, I've got to clean up. The time I had friends around and I'm changing Tom's nappy on the side. And he then does this yellow projectile bowel movement all over the TV and the side. It's just like you're going to get them right and you've got to laugh those moments define your fatherhood career there are going to be thousands of great memories but if you readjust the way you look at those really bad ones when they vomit like you've bought a brand new car my wife got a brand new business car and tom chunders all over the inside on day one and you're like yeah it's parenting it's brilliant and they were they were too difficult times but you they bond you 
They really do. When your child gets injured, that's the time to man up. You put all your needs aside. Yeah. It's just, and I don't think, I always used to think I had a unique take on it. But the more I speak to other dads now, it runs deep and understand that your wife goes through things we can never understand all right right? we don't have those massive hormone issues all right we didn't give birth we'll never have that but you're a dad and i think you need to step up and let's say it you need to be a man about it all right you need to protect and i know we live in a society that's evolving and changing and people are saying oh well 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 you can't say that but i think that's where we've gone wrong and why so many kids don't have dads and you can see the statistics are in there single parent families the children struggle more yes you will always get the exception i've seen some great kids from some amazing mums but i've been in the playground i see the way mums are you know when you're telling a child off mums will and i really don't wish to upset you mums okay but you'll all be talking your kid jumps in the puddle and you're just turning there no don't do that tim and then you go back to talking and the kid will still do it whereas a dad i'll go stop that and they stop it because i mean it and i we have that way of saying and i still turn around to my stepkids and i go would you speak to me like that when they've spoken to their mum badly would you speak to your dad like that? Would you speak to your teachers like that? And they go, no, don't let me catch you talking to my other half like that. Yeah, she might be. And I once did that to my two boys. They only pushed the boundaries once when they were thirteen. Mm-hmm. Getting to that, right? I've got to usurp the silverback. That's my boys' quote, okay? Mm-hmm. And Jake s- swore at his brother, and I said, no, you don't swear. And he then, I'll effing swear if I want to. So he went outside. I held him up against the wall, feet off the ground, and told him, and I always remember this, okay, no one speaks to my wife like that. I, I mm. put him down and sent him up to his room. And that, they'd cross the line, and I'm like saying, she might be your mum, but she is my wife, and no one gets that pass. Like, yeah. That's solid dad voice right there. Love it. Love it. That's all dad voice. I hate that's part of our role. Listen, listen, Martin. So if folks want to learn more about you, where would they go? They can either just go onto Apple podcasts or any podcast type in calming anxiety. Right. I have 630 shows there. Right. Um, And then download the app. The beautiful Calming Anxiety app for Android. Or just go to calminganxiety.net. Not calminganxiety.net. Okay. Now, is that so you said the app, it's on Google. Is it also on Apple? Yeah, it's on iOS. And, and Perfect. Yeah. Perfect. Martin, thank you so much. Thank you, Jay. It really, thank you very much. You're welcome. Cheers. Hey, feel good fathers. Hit that like button to let YouTube know that you liked this video. Comment below with your thoughts and reactions to this interview. I really want to hear what you have to say. Now, as a personal brand strategist, I hear all the time about coaches, trainers, speakers, and authors doing the right thing, but at the wrong time. We specialize in helping brand builders have more impact, more credibility and clarity, and developing an overall brand strategy. When you work with Brand Builders Group, we'll help you do the right thing at the right time. Request a free brand call below. There's a link in the description. And don't forget to subscribe. You'll get updates when the new episodes are launched. And it really helps out the community and the channel. We'll see you next time.